Welcome back, everybody. We are continuing our live coverage here at the North American International Auto Show, Detroit Auto Show, colloquially. Uh, it's the road show stage. Brian Cooley, our editor-in-chief, Tim Stevens, and now being joined by one of our friends in the biz, Mark Fields, CEO of Ford, of course. Hey, Mark. Always love being on with you guys. Oh, we you got a lot of passion. You, here. you got a lot of energy. That's what it's all about. Despite the fact that we're two weeks in a row here, we're going yeah. to search for CEOs <laughs> right here, back to back. We're hanging in We're there. all moving like a mob from CES <laughs> to Detroit now. You didn't uh, have any lack of news on the press conference today. Yeah. Let's start with F-150, which had a lot of very specific new innovations mm -hmm. going on, uh, including a diesel. Why yeah. is diesel so important? Well, diesel is important because, you know, our, our customers are using the F-150 as a tool. And when you look at diesel and you look at the capability, low end torque, those type of things, our customers were telling us, hey, we'd love to have this. And we were listening to them. And that's, that's allowed us to be the best selling truck for 40 years in a row, the best selling vehicle here in the US, 35 years in a row. Here, here's a little tidbit. Last year we sold uh, an F series every 39 seconds. <laughs> so. We really stay attuned to what the customer is asking. And Probably about 20 yeah. by the end of this interview then. Yeah. Right. We're right. already, yeah, yeah. Hey, we just sold one. This is right. profitable <laughs> time for you. So <laughs> now, I'm not really now the, the, the new F's been out, what, basically two years now, year and yes. change. Yes, yes. Uh, why was the diesel not there originally? Give us a snapshot of how product rollouts work, that that couldn't have been there right away if the demand was obvious. Yeah, well, obviously, we did an all-new ground-up uh, F-150 a little over two years ago. And as you've seen, every year we've added features and models. Right, last year we added the, the, the Raptor, we added the, uh, the 10 speed this year, now we're, you know, we're adding, we're adding the, uh, the diesel going forward. So as you look at that, there's so much resources that you have engineering wise, and you want to make sure that you get them focused on the base product. And then as the vehicle goes through its life cycle, you keep adding more feature, more content, more models that customer wants, and that allows you to stay in a leadership position. So EcoBoost and aluminum obviously were a higher priority to go mm -hmm. to market with. Right. And to get people's heads wrapped around the fact that you don't need a big gas V8. That was, a, that was as much of a breakthrough mentally as mm -hmm. getting them used yeah. to aluminum uh, structure, right? Well, it's, it's, if you look at our sales right now here in the United States, when you look at our EcoBoost options, they represent a little over 60% of our sales. Mm -hmm. And so as we go forward, the naturally aspirated V6, uh, the V8, and now the diesel will make up the, the rest of that. But you know, our approach on, on, on the new F-150 that we're showing here today is very in sync and consistent with what we've done over the last number of years. Make it the toughest, smartest, most capable F-150 ever. And uh, our customers are agreeing with us, and that gives us a lot more motivation mm -hmm. to do even more. And talking trucks, you guys did confirm that there will be a smaller truck or Ranger coming to the U.S. market, mm -hmm. something that a lot of people have been asking me about. When are we going to get a smaller <laughs> F-150? F We're because tired of answering the question. I've never, yes. thank you I've for never gotten that question. Thank you for announcing <laughs> it. <laughs> Take a little load <laughs> off us. A, we didn't see the truck, and let me just say that we're a little disappointed about that. <laughs> but how will that impact F-150 sales? Is yeah. that going to be taking away from the success of the F-150, having this smaller, presumably? No, we don't option? think so. I mean, there may be some customers who would have purchased an F-150 that are going to purchase a Ranger. But when you look at our total sales for trucks, I think it's going to be very incremental because, you know, we've listened to our customers, and a number of our customers want a a smaller truck, they want one more affordable, more maneuverable, functional, and of course, built Ford tough. And that's why we're bringing the Ranger here in 2019. And listen, we got a lot of loyal owners and they were waiting because the last one that we built was in 2011 and we can't okay. wait to get it into the marketplace to them. Now, I know you can't uh, give us any specific answers on the new Bronco, which is, talk about getting tapping into a passion, that's a cult. But can you tell us this? Can you at least tell us, have you locked the size of the thing yet? Or is that still a moving target? Well, we're in the process, as we said, we're going to bring it to market in 2020. So as you can imagine, uh, we've locked in some key assumptions around that vehicle. I mean, the first thing is, as you look at that segment, that rugged segment of the SUV market, that's been one of the fastest growing over the last five years. And so uh, when you look at our history, there's, a, as you said, there's a lot of love out there mm -hmm. for Broncos. Mm -hmm. I mean, just count the number of websites, yeah. uh, advocate websites that are out there. And so you can expect that it will be a, about the size of a Ranger. Uh, it, it will be body on frame, uh, and it, it won't be aluminum. It will be, it will be steel with right. probably some aluminum closures, those type of things. And the reason for that is because we want it to deliver what the, what the Bronco is known for. Because keep in mind, we had the Bronco on the market for 30 years, from 1966 to 1996. 
So there's a lot of expectation that we live up to. Yeah, and the Bronco meant a lot of things over those times. It, it was a much larger vehicle toward the end. It was incredibly small and almost square in its footprint when it was young. The first, the first series, 66 through I think 69 or 71, it was a, it had a very thing. small footprint, yeah. Yeah. and it grew over time. Yeah. Uh, but it, it'll be about the – think about it in the, in the size of a, a Ranger in terms of the footprint. Okay, okay, that's helpful. Um, so we should also talk about tech because we're all yeah. about tech here at Roadshow. There's oh been yeah. plenty of tech announcements both here in Detroit and also last week. Uh, pretty s significant uh, autonomy announcements. You've been saying 2021 and recommitting to that date. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a, an advanced, more advanced sensor package, a little bit smaller, a little bit more discreet. Can you give us an update on where you are with your autonomy <laughs> testing and, and where we are in terms of progress of bringing those sensors to the price point that we can actually mm -hmm. get them on a car that anybody can afford? Well, as you know, we're out there with uh, our commitment to the intent to have a fully autonomous vehicle, a level four vehicle by 2021. And the reason I say level four, I strongly believe that the industry is throwing around the term autonomously very liberally. Yeah. And there's different levels. And level four is the level on which the passenger never has to take control of the vehicle. So in a predefined area that's been mapped, no brake okay. pedal, no gas pedal, no steering wheel. And uh, where we are in the process is we showed at CES our next generation fusion hybrid autonomous vehicle research um, development vehicle. And it includes the latest uh, LiDAR systems. A year ago I, at, at CES, I, I, I gave a keynote and I showed the, the puck version, the size of a hockey puck. Yeah. That's now integrated into the vehicle from a styling standpoint, much more integrated. Uh, Cameras, you know, seven cameras that now much more greater ability to see through fog and rain and things of that nature. But we will have, we'll have 30 of those vehicles on the road this month. We're going to triple it to 90. So we are on plan. And as you know, we're working on you know, the four elements of an autonomous vehicle. The sensors, you know, the LIDARs, the cameras, the radars. We're working on the algorithms for path planning for where the vehicle wants to go to. Uh, we're working on the computer vision and also the machine learning. And then finally, those 3D high definition maps. So let's talk about the cost of all the equipment, especially the hardware. I mean, yeah. we're at the point where the hardware is not commodity yet. It's very expensive, mm -hmm. uh, even especially as you work down the, the miniaturization of it. Uh, I think the, uh, the Google Waymo people are saying they're going to work on building their own sensors just to drive costs down, not mm -hmm. to become a vendor. Uh, maybe as much as 90% they're envisioning fairly soon. Can you do that? Do you need to get in the sensor business? And if not, is there any kind of government incentive program that you're hoping will crop up the way it has come up around electrification to subsidize the cost of early AVs? Well, I don't think we're looking for subsidization from the government. I think what we're looking for the government for is unified regula re regulatory yeah. uh, approaches, standard, you know, 50 statewide as opposed to individual state by state. And, and I give the Department of Transportation and Secretary Fox a lot of credit because they've been very forward leaning on this because they see the societal, the environmental, uh, and the safety benefits of autonomous vehicles. But you know, as we go forward, we are, we're working on all elements of the, the vehicle. Our, fir our approach is the, uh, our first application of it will be in a commercial kind of ride hailing or, or ride sharing service because the cost will be higher than obviously a non-AV mm -hmm. vehicle and also because of adoption rates. But um, you know, we're really excited about, uh, about where we're heading on this. Isn't it there a reason or a rationale to subsidize autonomous vehicles? If we believe in electrification, why not go after what I think the auto industry agrees is already a better driver than most drivers. It has to go a longer way for acceptance. Yeah. Why wouldn't the government subsidize that in discussions or understandings you have? Has that ever come up or is that just not a non-starter? Uh, non no, it hasn't come up. And, and part of the reason is when you think of autonomous vehicles and the first applications of it, as I said, the first applications will most primarily be in a ride sharing or ride hailing service All right. uh, as opposed to, let's say, dual use for a private customer. Now, could you get to a point where they would subsidize that? Uh, don't know. We'd always be open to that, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, we want to make sure that this technology stands on its own, and uh, and we'll have to see what happens. I'd like to make sure that the government is really focusing on that regulatory environment and also helping us with that would be enough of a subsidy in a sense well, to ex clear exactly the, clear the path and a, and a and a legal construct right in yeah. terms of if. if you know, what is what is the re legal construct of this if the vehicle has a you know accident or things of that nature? 
And how much is that regulatory mess that you mentioned now slowing down or impacting your testing? You, know, you can't really drive your one EV in every state, at least not without making a lot of trips to the DMV. Uh, how much is that slowing you down, or are you able to do enough of your testing in Michigan now and in the few other states that have regulations in place? Well, the good news, as you said, we've been doing our testing in Michigan, which is a very forward-leaning mm -hmm. state, on, uh, and they've just enacted a couple of weeks ago some new legislation uh, which will enable it even more. We test in Arizona at our proving grounds. We're beginning to test in California. So I think it, it's not, so answer to your question, it's not slowing us down. Great. Uh, and we're going very aggressively and making sure we get not so much the miles racked up. Uh, miles are important, but what's even more important is scenarios uh, that a car would uh, will encounter. Because you can go lots of miles yeah. on, a, routine on, miles. on Route 80 and yeah. never yeah. encounter a scenario. Yeah, you almost want to rack up challenge miles exactly. if you that way. You they know? call un them un corner cases mm -hmm. in, the, in the industry. Of course. Yeah. That's where you're, you know, some, some mm -hmm. wild combination of people, cars, animals, yeah. you name it. All at once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, Weather. Mark, before we let you go, got to ask, as we do every year, what are you driving these days? I drive an Explorer. You're an Explorer. Uh, okay, you were in Mustang last time. I, you I, I, you. You're in a Cobra, I think. And, you know, the good news is I get to drive a lot of different cars. <laughs> uh, the even better news is when you look at our lineup, uh, it, it really is a tremendous lineup these days. And, and the best news is, is customers are, are voting. I mean, we just wrapped up 2016 here, obviously, in the U.S., Best, best year we've had in over a decade, best-selling brand, um, and uh, again, wrapped up some, um, some really great uh, sales awards for either our F-Series or uh, Lincoln, et cetera. Sure. Congratulations. Great. Thanks a lot.